Hello, I'm Jeremy Collins, the Director of Conferences and Symposia at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. Thank you for tuning in to World War II On Topic. This episode is brought to you by the museum's Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. Today, we are going to listen to Dr. Rob Satino, the Samuel Zamuri Stone Senior Historian here at the museum, and author historian Anthony Tucker Jones. Anthony joined us on December 1st, 2021 for the annual Orlin Russell Corey Memorial Lecture, a partnered program with the Churchill Society of New Orleans. In conversation with Satino, he discussed his latest work, Churchill, Master and Commander, Winston Churchill at War, 1895 to 1945. It is so wonderful to be here in person tonight before this crowd to share the experience of learning about what great leadership is all about. Olin Russell Corey was a great contributor to this museum and tonight we are here for the Olin Russell Corey lecture which was named in his honor and we've brought tonight Anthony Tucker Jones and his lovely wife, Amelia. Um, and I assure you, you're gonna enjoy his presentation that he and Rob will make tonight. The great Rob Satino, of course, the Samuel Zamuri, will be his interviewer and moderator of the, of the panel discussion. The book, Churchill, Master and Commander, is just a wonderful read. Now, full disclosure, I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing because it's only been put out this year and released worldwide this week in New Orleans, even ahead of the UK. That's pretty good. He's been involved, Anthony has, in a series of events this week culminating in this last but not least uh, Orlin, Corey, Orlin Russell Corey lecture here at the museum. I think you had a chance to tour the museum today for the first time, and it is their first trip to New Orleans, but I know it won't be your last. So having said that, I'll only tell you about the book that there may be events that you know of, but there are nuanced details in this book that will give you a different perspective and an insight into things that will make you think about things just a little bit differently. And last night I introduced uh, Anthony and I sang one of the things that was in his book, but I'm not gonna do that to you tonight. <laughs> so with that, I welcome Anthony Tucker Jones and Rob Satino. Anthony, it's wonderful to be with you here tonight. Thanks for coming to New Orleans. Thank you very much, Rob. I, uh, I heard Mike pronounce New Orleans pretty well. It, it took me a while. Um, I'll ha I have my story, which I'll be very brief with. My first trip here, I had to get in a cab and ask to be taken to Chapatulas Avenue. <laughs> and I, w I don't remember how I pronounced it, but the cabbie turned to me and said, that's not even close, man. <laughs> so, so ever since, I've been really, really working at that. The more you come here, you'll realize that the, the place names can be kind of daunting. So thanks for coming, and I have to say this. I told everyone I was very taken with this uh, book. Matter of fact, I've been kind of telling everyone I ran into today about that. You know, I think there must be a thousand Churchill biographies out there. I, I don't, Andrew Roberts there in your intro says, says it's an avalanche. Yeah. Your book looks at Sir Winston from a different point of view, and I think... I think took a different tack. Tell us about the genesis of this book. Why this book? Um, well, I've been a military historian for quite a while now, and uh, Churchill's always featured in a lot of my books. I've written quite extensively on the sort of 44, 45 campaigns, and he's always been a player with all the other great leaders of the Second World War, Roosevelt, Marshall, you know, Eisenhower, Bradley, all those people, and obviously the British generals, Wavell, uh, the list goes on. But he was never my focus um, and I had kind of a series of events that thought maybe it was about time to, to tackle the great man, if you like. But what I wanted to do was do it explicitly from a military point of view. A fair bit's been written, off, obviously, on his wartime leadership during the Second World War. But I really wanted to delve down into the, the weeds, if you like, about what it was in his early life that had informed him uh, to be the right man in the right place at the right time come May 1940s. So that was kind of the driving idea behind it all. I, 
I think it's that interplay between the sort of early Churchill, about which I think people know relatively little, yeah. and then the, the later Churchill. Um, we know the events of his life, but I think you were able to bring insight into them because we now had a better sense of the formative years of the man. Yes, I mean, the thing I drew out of uh, the research I was doing, that he's, um, you know, he took inordinate risks throughout his life, both as a young and an old man, and I kind of think that stuck with him throughout his life, which I think really prepared him for being prime minister. Right. You know, um, he, he clearly learned that nothing was gained from life without taking a risk, and he did it all his life. You know, uh, it's kind of the impetuousness of youth. Right. He carried that into his, you know, well, right up until he was 90, really. So you, it, always good to begin at the beginning. In line one of your book, <laughs> we're going to work our way through the entire book line by line. So settle in. Um, <laughs> really? <laughs> in the opening line of your book, you write, Winston Churchill was one of the greatest military and political chancers of all time. Now, for us colonials who might yeah. not understand the nuances of transatlantic English, um, what specifically do you mean? What is a chancer? <laughs> Well, in English, it, it can re refer to criminality. Uh, wow. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, sometimes it's someone operating on the wrong side of the law. They're a bit dodgy, we like to say in English. Uh, but in Churchill's context, obviously I didn't really mean that, it's that he's a gambler. You know, that he was, he, he was, he was a chancer because he was, he was prepared to chance his hand at many, many things. Um, and throughout his life, I think as most of us we know, he gambled an awful lot. And he got it wrong sometimes, but a lot of the time he got it right as well. I found the book uh, nicely balanced. This is not a hagiography. Hey you're, you're quite, pr you, you praise Sir Winston when he yeah. deserves it. And yeah. I, I think there were times you're quite critical as well. And I, yeah. I found the book nicely balanced. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I wouldn't have spent two and a half years with the man on and off um, if I loathed him. You, you, the more you learn about him, the more you respect him. I mean, his achievements are enormous. Um, you know, when you realize of all the things that he did, uh, you know, as a war correspondent, as a soldier, as an author, as a politician, uh, as a bricklayer, um, you know, all those things he did, playing polo, painting, you know, he had this passion for life. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what you respect in him, I think. So while we're on the subject of words, um, early on in the book, you attribute much of Churchill's rise to, to fame to, and I'm quoting, Brazen doorstepping of senior <laughs> military commanders. <laughs> now, I, I think I may know what this means, but I'm not quite sure. Please explain it to us. <laughs> um, what I meant by that was that Churchill was more than prepared to use his contacts um, because he was a great believer. I'm sure you have this, this saying as well. It's, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And Churchill was a great believer in that. Uh, and later in life, of course, he called in favors from politicians and business people and generals that he knew uh, as he rose up through the political ranks. Uh, but in his early life, that simply consisted of him constantly pestering his mother, uh, Lady Randolph, um, to use her connections uh, to get him postings when he was in the military. Which are considered, her connections are considerable. Yeah, they are considerable. Um, you know, it was through his father's connections in Madrid that he managed to get himself packed off to Cuba. He had no business being there, uh, but they pulled a few strings. And of course, his presence, for example, in Cuba, just after he'd been commissioned, uh, caused some embarrassment to the British government because, of course, he was there whilst he was on leave, uh, in uniform, as a journalist, uh, assigned to the Spanish general staff, uh, which only lead the Spanish government to believe uh, he was part of a, an official British mission, which, of course, was completely untrue. And what it made it look like to the international community uh, was that Britain was supporting Spain's activities in Cuba, which it was not. Uh, but, of course, that, that's how the media read it. Um, so he, he constantly did that. I mean, he made himself... People don't realise he made himself quite unpopular with his behaviour. Mm -hmm. um, and also, he, he had a terrible habit of short um, you know, shortcutting the chain of command as well. So you point out many times in this book, Chir Churchill not only participated in war as a young man, you've already mentioned uh, uh, Cuba, uh, he, he did so often at the risk of his own safety in life, but he also made a living writing about it. So this book is a fascinating, I, I thought, sort of a interplay between war and journalism, because you have this figure in, in whom they, they intersect. So he's in the Sudan, the Boer War, fighting on the northwest frontier of the, the Raj. How would you rate him? And, and I mean that in two ways. Um, as a soldier, but maybe more important for our purposes, as a writer. Yeah. 
Um, to answer the first part of your question, it's difficult to rate him as a soldier because, of course, he wasn't really a soldier for very long. Uh, he resigned his commission fairly quickly, uh, particularly after the British War Office gave him an ultimatum, which was you either be a soldier or you, uh, and stop being a journalist, or you be a journalist and resign because of his behaviour. Uh, famously with the Sudan campaign, of course, he wrote the, the book you know, on the River War, uh, where he criticised the British commander. And, of course, these days, um, you know, military generals are not really supposed to talk out of turn uh, about government policy, which is what he did. And, of course, he was still in uniform at the, uh, at the time. So t tell us more about Churchill then as a writer. What, is, it, is there a style that you would attribute to him? And, well, initially, it was very journalistic, obviously, and he became more, more scholarly as time went on. But the interesting thing with Churchill's writing was, he obviously, he, he, he didn't perform very well at school. Um, and once he was an army officer, he kind of self-educated himself. He, he, he got lots of books and he read, uh, read history and all sorts of things. So he sort of educated himself. But the truth of the matter with his writing, it was simply driven by the fact he had no money. So though, although he was an aristocrat and the son of a lord, um, you know, and was descended from uh, John Churchill, first Duke of Marlborough, he had no money. Uh, and once his father had died, uh, his, mo his mother, you know, uh, Jenny Jerome, uh, she spent the family money quite quickly. Um, so he had to find a way of earning money. As an army officer, you didn't earn a great deal. Because uh, the, the thing that amazed me when I looked into his writing was the absolutely enormous advances that he commanded for his books. Um, you know, by today's standards, they would be in millions. I mean, he'd be up there with, I don't know, you know, John Grisham, uh, Anne Rice, perhaps, you know, those sorts of people, high earners. And Churchill managed to get out of his publishers, partly because, of course, the power of his family name, but partly because, of course, he was a good salesman and they gave him a lot of money. Um, in terms of the accuracy of his books, well, today we would accuse him of being um, responsible for, shall we say, artistic license. <laughs> Um, so certain Where would our careers be? Uh, well, it? yeah, it's, it's, um, someone used to say to me, never, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. And um, Churchill indulged in that just a little bit. You know, uh, I'm trying to think which it was. It's probably actually the Malacan Field Force book that he wrote. One of the generals that was actually there when he saw the book, I mean, he, he accused Churchill of inaccuracies in places he was quite critical. Um, but of course, these days we have you know the joys of the internet and fact checker, and as soon as you put something wrong on paper, everybody knows. Um, and also, of course, to be fair to Churchill, uh, he was often going by by memory. You know, uh, quite often what he did was he multitasked. So whenever he went off uh, on campaign, he'd get an assignment with the newspaper and he'd write columns for for them from the wars that he went on. Uh, and then when he got home, he turned those newspaper columns into books. They formed. Um, you know, the basis of the book. So for you and I, that would be our basic research, wouldn't it? It laid the groundwork for creating something much bigger. Um, so that's kind of how he worked. So you mentioned several of his early works. You mentioned Malacan Field Force. He wrote a couple of books about the South African War, the Boer War, as, yeah. as our British friends call it. You know, he's actually captured there by, by, by enemy forces, and he escapes. I remember, Anthony, reading this for the first time. It's, it's thrilling. There's an armored train. There's a, a roadblock. There's a boar ambush. <laughs> he, he describes a bullet came over one shoulder and then over another shoulder, and I thought two words went through my mind: boar marksmanship. You know, yeah. he knew where the and, and, and so he talks about, and then he escapes, <laughs> and then he wrote a book about it. Or actually, wrote wrote two. Can you share some of the details of of, of Winston Churchill's career in South Africa? Surely, Winston went to South Africa as a war correspondent. So by that point, he'd resigned his commission. Uh, so he turned up in South Africa looking for adventure and a good story. Um, and he met an officer that he'd, he'd served with in India uh, who was going on patrol on a train. Um, Churchill really had no business in going. In fact, he'd done the same route several times on horse, uh, but I think it's Captain Haldine, I'm going from memory here, asked him if he'd accompany them on this train reconnaissance uh, because Churchill had already done the route, so he knew the lie of the land. Um, but when you think going on a reconnaissance in a train is not a good idea, because, of course, the thing can only go forwards or right. backwards. <laughs> uh, and I think you can guess what happened once the Boers realized that a train full of British soldiers was happily chuffing up the um, South African valleys, and they were, and they were ambushed. 
Um, Churchill didn't help himself because the way he dressed made him look like a soldier. Um, today we would call him a paramilitary. I mean, he looked like a paramilitary. The sort of khaki fatigues that he had on looked like he was a soldier. And the train was ambushed and it was derailed and it was shelled by the Boers and they were all shot at. And Churchill, although he had resigned his commission, couldn't help himself but get involved in the rescue operation. And I found this incident bizarre because I think there was a captain there and two lieutenants. So they should have been in charge. So you've got Churchill there as a civilian who pretty much takes over the operation to clear the line, get the train running. Uh, and the captain there basically let him get on with it. I mean, he thought Churchill was a, a good egg, you know, knew what he was doing. Um, so he let him get on with this rescue operation. But he had no business doing that. The lieutenants, they should have been responsible for that. So there's Churchill under fire with all the boars, waving his arms around, giving directions while they got boulders off the line and shifted the derail carriages, ready to get on their way, which they did. I mean, Churchill was inordinately brave and he was under fire all the time and he helped get the wounded on the train. And, uh, and the train left with Churchill on board. But some of the soldiers covering the train, they couldn't all get on it. So he got off to go back and help them. Uh, and in the process was captured by the boars. And of course, when they captured him, also, he'd been carrying a weapon, which as a war correspondent, you shouldn't do. I mean, these days, press have, you know, blue helmets on with press all over, so everyone knows that they are not, they're non-combatant. Churchill had been carrying his trusty Mauser pistol, which he'd used in Omdurman, uh, but by good fortune, he'd left it on the train. But when the Boers captured him and searched him, they found a clip of ammunition in his pocket, which he claimed he'd picked up. But, I mean, that's a fairly spurious excuse. Plus, of course, they'd seen him from the hilltops down on the railway line directing British soldiers. So as far as they were concerned, um, he was a prisoner of war, which is how they treated him. And he tried to persuade them that he wasn't, um, and they just wouldn't believe him. Um, but he eventually escaped. He and some officers put together um, this plan to get away. Uh, he managed to slip away, but they didn't. Um, and he managed to reach Port, uh, Portuguese Mozambique. And you think at that point, he's probably had enough fun and adventure. You could understand it if he'd gone home. Honor had been served. But no, Winston being Winston, got on a boat and he sailed back down to Durban where he, he volunteered for a local regiment uh, and went back to war as a soldier and as a correspondent again. It's just, it's, if, um, if I didn't know it was real, I'd say, this is improbable. Yeah, it yeah, works. I mean, his... Uh, I think Schutzpah, would you say? Hutzpah. You know, uh, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it, 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 For Winston, it, it, it knew no limits. I mean, you know, uh, again, it's a reflection of the man he became later in life. This is the National World War II Museum, and I want to get to World War II, but I have one, we'll, we'll deal with World War I in a single question, if you don't mind. If Sir Winston were walking to the room right now, and I said one word to him, Gallipoli. What would be his reaction? You know, certainly it was a catastrophe. He cast a long shadow over his military and political career. How responsible was he for the mess there? Uh, Rob, I think you would be subject to one of the Winston famous scowls, oh. quite <laughs> frankly. I think he would sigh, and then I think he'd look really chestfallen, yeah, and then puff furiously on his cigar <laughs> before coming out with a very witty rejoiner. <laughs> like, what have you done in your life? Yes. <laughs> So to World War II. You know, as you note, when, when Winston became prime minister in May of 1940, the British fortunes are looking bad. The, the, the Germans are rampaging already in the, in the French, French campaign. You know, he also created a new position for himself, minister of defense. Now, that means he placed himself directly above the chiefs of staff. Yeah. So from the British perspective, can we say that the spring of 1940, this becomes Churchill's war in a very real sense? Yes, I mean, very much so. You're right. That's pretty much the thesis of the book, you know, hence the subtitle Master and Commander. Churchill very cleverly made himself the country's political master and its military commander. Uh, and by appointing himself the country's very first defense minister, he took over directly the strategic conduct of Britain's war efforts. Uh, and he did that because it meant the chiefs of staff had to answer to him directly and not the Secretary of State for war because he knew that bureaucracy was not a good way to con conduct a war. Couple to which I think he sincerely thought he knew best, mm -hmm. you know. We always talk about Dunkirk and that campaign. And many of us have seen the recent movie. And for good reason, of course, we'll be talking about Dunkirk forever. 
There are many analysts who will tell you that Dunkirk would not have been possible without a determined stand of British forces at, at the town of Calais. Um, tell us about Churchill's role there. He, he made a decision, he said, and when I was making that decision, I had a feeling I was going to be sick. Why is that? Because he had to consign uh, British troops at Calais under a brigadier basically to death or capture. He took that decision to evacuate Dunkirk in late May, uh, but he knew one of the ways to take pressure off the Dunkirk pocket was to divert the Germans. So he basically told the brigadier that the garrison, the Anglo-French garrison at Calais, would not be evacuated. So he took the decision to leave them there because all the time that they were there, the Germans obviously couldn't ignore them and they had to divert forces to reduce Calais. So that's what he did. He basically sent them a message saying there will be no evacuation and you're expected to fight to the last, which for the British Army is not really a tradition. It does do it. You know, uh, it has a fine track record of courage and heroism and fighting to the last. But, Brit but generals and British officers do not explicitly say to their men, you are to fight to the death. I mean, that's sort of behavior you would expect from, you know, Hitler with the Wehrmacht. I was just about to say. Or Stalin with the Red command, Army. Yeah, I yeah. Right. It almost smacks of totalitarianism, that, that order to die. I mean, it, it just wasn't in his nature. But he knew that they had to do it because it bought crucial hours uh, to enable, you know, the organization of the evacuation uh, for the rear guard to protect the shrinking pocket, um, you know, because the German panzer are sort of headed west. And of course, the minute they started to wheel east, they were going to overrun the Dunkirk pocket very quickly. So by keeping Calais, it kept the Germans distracted. But it was a difficult decision for him to make. I mean, um, you know, his generals supported it. I mean, they understood the strategic necessity to do it, but it wasn't a difficult decision. I mean, I think it haunted him, you know, but it, but of course, that was a measure of the man because he rose to that difficult decision. You know, Dunkirk itself was a difficult decision because he knew damn well the minute he authorized uh, the evacuation of the British Army, British Expeditionary Force um, from France and Dunkirk, it would signal to the French government that Britain was abandoning them. I mean, you couldn't see it any other way. Uh, I mean, to be fair to Churchill, there were still other units in other parts of France. But by removing the bulk of them from Dunkirk, you know, it basically said to the French government, our priority is to save our manpower and not France. Uh, and that was a difficult decision for Churchill. And indeed, for a while, they didn't tell the French what was going on. I mean, the French were essentially help, helping defend the pocket, because I think for a while, French military thought they were going to be evacuated and that they would come back. But of course, because of the events unfolded so quickly, there was no way of doing that. I thought that was a, that was a, a part of the book. I know that campaign very well. I've been writing about it for my whole yeah. life, but I thought that was a part of the book where you really nailed a, a kind of crucial moment that I don't think has often been given its due. So I was very well, I, I think, um, you know, not to belabor the Dunkirk campaign too much, but of course, I think it was partly out of guilt, you know, because Churchill was not a heartless man. As we all know, he was quite emotional. and was, was, you know, subject to crying quite often. But I think that decision to abandon the French weighed on him quite heavily. And that's one of the reasons that he sent the Navy back, you know, those last few nights to evacuate as many Frenchmen as he could. Um, you, you can probably remember better than I could, but I mean, the evacuation figures about, I think, 320,000. Um, but about a third of them were actually French and Belgian soldiers. So the RAF and the Navy, um, you know, sacrificed ships and lives to rescue them. Uh, and of course, when they got back to England, they basically all sailed back to France to carry on the war. But in very short order, of course, France surrendered and it would be much better in light of the sacrifice that the evacuation forces had done if they'd stayed in Britain, of course, and had joined de Gaulle, but that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Couple months for fast forward, as we like to say in America. Let's talk about just real quickly the Battle of Britain, if you will. When I think of Winston Churchill and the Battle of Britain, I think of some of the most stirring speeches that anybody has ever made in, in history. Um, their, their finest hour, um, and the, never in the field of human conflict, it's just beautiful words. What was Churchill's military contribution to the Battle of Britain? I mean, so apart from that stirring rhetoric, did he make a difference? Was this, uh, could we say, Winston's finest hour? Mm, yes, I think so, because obviously uh, Dunkirk and the Battle of Britain firmly signaled uh, to Hitler and, and indeed Mussolini that Britain was not going to seek a negotiated settlement out of the war. And by taking that decision, of course, it consigned Britain to fight the Battle of, well, Battle of Britain, uh, and also, of course, endure the Blitz. It meant our cities were subject to German bombers, 
Um, and again, Churchill pretty much knew that that was going to happen. But one of the sort of fallacies of the Battle of Britain, which I quite like, is, of course, is that image of a, um, a bunch of you know, very brave, very young fighter pilots on their own fending off the Luftwaffe, which is very, very true. But there's actually another element to it because Churchill took that decision because he was well informed because Bletchley Park had cracked the Enigma codes. So they were able to read an awful lot of the Luftwaffe's SIGINT. So they knew quite a bit about the Luftwaffe's intentions and where it was going. Um, so he was quite well informed. And the other thing is, of course, with the Battle of Britain, um, during the late 1930s, the British had been building up RAF Fighter Command, so under Hugh Dowding. And by good fortune, of course, as a lot of you all know, we had the Hurricane Fighter and the Spitfire Fighter just going into production. So they arrived in the nick of time. And equally crucially, Britain had spent money on something called radio direction finding, uh, which you guys, of course, will know as radar, and subsequently became known as radar. So Britain had this RDF system called um, a low and high chain, two sets of radar. And one of those could pick the Luftwaffe up taking off in France and Norway, so we had advance warning, and likewise could pick them up coming across the channel. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen the 1960s film Battle of Britain, which I think even today stands, stands the test of time. It's very, very good. But there's a sequence in it that sticks with me when you've got the Royal Observer Corps on the coast, you know, watching the bombers coming overhead and frantically counting them, which, you know, to credit to them, they did do. But, of course, the RAF already knew, courtesy of radar, quite how many were coming. Um, there's a particular story that I do in the book when Churchill turned up unannounced at RAF Fighter Command's headquarters. I think it's High Wycombe, I'm going from memory here. Um, to watch the battle, um, and the op operation center commander was a bit worried that there wouldn't be much going on that day and that Churchill would be bored. Whereas actually the reason Churchill knew was there was because he knew, courtesy of Bletchley, uh, that a big raid was on the way. So he'd come to watch how the RAF actually would conduct itself. And of course, thankfully, it conducted itself very well. Um, but on a number of visits when he went there, I mean, even the RAF said to the, him, regardless of the advantages we've got, you know, they were almost overwhelmed on, on at least one occasion. He asked them, what other squadrons have you got in reserve ready to put up? And they basically said, they're all up there, that's it, you know. Um, and then, of course, there was then a panic because once they run out of fuel, you've got to get them back on the ground, poised to get in the air the minute the Luftwaffe have done exactly the same thing and are on their way back. You know, there's... So he didn't... Sorry, so, yes. so that was a long-winded answer, Rob, to your no. question. Essentially, his contribution was quite significant because he was making decisions that were not off the cuff. He was well informed. You know, there, there is that kind of uh, view that the Battle of Britain was sort of very much, you know, they winged it. Yes, right. You know, right. No pun intended. Um, but in fact, the RAF and Churchill, were, you know, they knew what was going on. You describe in, in wonderful detail a real rich portion of the book this new expanded war after late 1941 into 1942, the, yeah. the new global war. You call it a juggling act. You know, this is a difficult period for, for Churchill. Um, it's certain that, you know, this, this new expanded war began pretty inauspiciously. Just a brief re recap, the loss of Prince of Wales and Renown, the fall of Singapore, the loss of Burma, the fall of Tobruk, unrest in India, lest we, lest we forget. How does Churchill manage to juggle all that? How does he manage to stay in power overseeing a war effort that seems to be, I don't think I'm exaggerating, careening into catastrophe. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a complete disaster. As we've, as, we've, as we've just discussed, his stock went up very quickly because of Dunkirk. You know, it gave the country, um, you know, it boosted the country's morale. Uh, the Battle of Britain, although horrible, boosted the country's morale. Uh, and then it very quickly came off the rails. It all went wrong. Um, largely through no fault of his own, although he did take certain decisions that made the situation worse. Um, and ultimately, it led to a number of votes of no confidence in him. I mean, he could have been ousted, quite frankly. I mean, as, as you rightly read out, it's a litany of woe, quite frankly. But he was in a difficult position. He only had, you know, so many resources to go around. And until such point as America entered the war... Uh, was in a difficult position. I mean, one of the difficult things he had was, of course, once Russia entered the war, 
he gave Stalin a pledge to send him equipment, but of course that came at a cost of not sending it to the British Army in the Middle East uh, or the Far East. So that's, that was my sense on the juggling act, is that he had finite, finite resources and they could only be stretched so far. So I think some of the best discussion in the book here, as an American, I'm always attuned to this particular angle. It revolves around the question of, of Britain and the empire. You know, here Winston has a real problem. He knows he needs FDR and U.S. support to win the war. Yeah. But he also knows something about his friend, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who is no empire man, quite the contrary. You know, at times, as in Burma, it seems like the, the U.S. and the British are fighting two separate wars, or they're there for, for different reasons. How does Churchill navigate these troubled waters? Well, the trouble Churchill had, I mean, he had a really good strategic grasp on the, on the war, um, but it, when it came to the Far East, of course, his interests were pretty much diametrically opposed to Roosevelt's in that his primary goal was to safeguard the future of the British Empire. Roosevelt, under some understandably, his position was, I'm not going to prop up the French or the British Empires come the end of the war. And of course, for America, its primary objective was to put, support the nationalists in China uh, to safeguard them from Japan. And also, of course, uh, in the same stroke, support the war in the Pacific. So America's strategic interests were quite different to what Churchill wanted, which essentially was the liberation of Burma and Malaya in order to retrieve Singapore, because, of course, that had been a key British naval base in that part of the world during the Second World War. And he knew that the only way really to restore Britain's prestige in the Far East was to liberate Singapore. And that was his goal, whereas, of course, that was not America's. Um, I was quite surprised to, when I was researching the book to find actually that both the British and Americans had run counter-espionage operations against each other in India. As because, friends will. Yes, as <laughs> friends will. Yeah, I mean, Britain was equally as guilty of it as, as America. You know, I mentioned the operations of the OSS there in India. Um, Britain, you know, I discovered ran counter-Indian nationalist operations in America, you know, the British kept an eye on Indian nationalists because we were worried about their fundraising activities around the world, including America, um, you know, what they were up to, swaying public opinion, all those sorts of things. Um, so, yes, there was a, a difference of interest. The other thing that was quite interesting was um, Churchill fretted about the fate of China, I think, more than Roosevelt did, because obviously... Churchill had been aware, you know, Churchill did not like the Bolsheviks or communism. So was aware that once the Chinese, uh, once the Second World War ended, the Chinese Civil War would be uh, kick-started. And he worried about the future of China, but of course there was nothing he could do to, he, he didn't have the resources, we didn't have very large numbers of people in China. Um, so he kind of was aware fairly early on that some sort of Cold War was going to emerge later on. Uh, and indeed, of course, Roosevelt and Stilwell were very cross that all that equipment that they supplied uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalist armies to fight the Japanese, large percentage of it disappeared into warehouses and wasn't issued to Chinese armies because the Chinese nationalists were saving it for a rainy day when the war with Mao Zedong and the communists kicked off again. You know, because... Uh, Chiang Kai-shek, obviously, again, was looking to the future, what would happen at the end of the war. Uh, they had a sort of gentleman's agreement with the communists that they would fight the Japanese because they had a common, common em enemy. But once the Japanese had gone, that war was going to start again. So I think still I was hoping the Chinese would put something like 30 divisions into the field. And nothing like that happened because, again, Chiang Kai-shek gave an awful lot of weapons um, to the warlords that supported him because they were the ones that were keeping him in power. I mean, China's politics at that time was incredibly complicated. It was a complete mess. Right. So when there's an outstanding issue between friends, let's say the issue of empire, is there a kind of a discreet, I don't know, gentleman's agreement that they don't d discuss it directly? Did Churchill ever sit Roosevelt down and try to explain him why the British Empire was a good thing for the for the world or for, for, for global stability? Did, did Roosevelt ever sit Churchill down and say, Winston, it's up? Um, I, certainly Roosevelt made it known that he wasn't happy, but of course Chiang Kai-shek wasn't happy either, having the British in India yeah. and supported Gandhi, felt that you know, India should be granted home rule, and that's perfectly understandable. Um, 
And Roosevelt supported that stance, and I don't think Churchill liked it, because, I mean, it would have been like Churchill giving America advice on the future of the Philippines, you know, which yes. he wouldn't have dreamed of doing. Right. But, it, but it was that sort of, that sort of situation. Um, and indeed, during the Quit India movement rising in 1942, Roosevelt sort of tried to help, but, you know, said to Churchill, for God's sake, don't get me involved, because obviously he, he appreciated it. It was a bit of a mess. Uh, and didn't want to get entangled in it, quite frankly. This um, is, I, I think you could write a book about this topic. Maybe your next book. It is a fascinating topic. I mean, you know, for most of us, we are kind of fascinated by the British Empire. Um, certainly in Britain in recent years, you know, there's this been, it's been line of thought, particularly with leftist historians, that it was a bad thing, that it was oppressive, that it was awful. Uh, and it's sort of been lumped in with lots of um, other empires. And I'm not saying it didn't have its bad factors, but... I mean, I saw a marvellous lecture by Andrew Roberts a few years ago when he was doing a spoof on Monty Python. I'm not sure how many men, people are familiar with them, but they were a, a British comedy troupe. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and they did films and all the rest of it. And they did this classic thing, I think it's in The Life of Brian, about what did the Romans ever do for us? And I saw Andrew Roberts doing that over India, and he's going, what did Britain ever do for India? You know, and he's going, uh, roads, railways, universities, a common language a functioning judicial system. You, you know, so you have to say there were some good things. And the thing that struck me when I was researching the book, I mean, Churchill was right that the term India was a geographic term. It's like how we would describe Europe. You know, that includes Spain and Germany. And it's only in recent years we've started to think of, you know, the European Union. We've started to think about po the possibility of a United States of Europe. But Europe, uh, up until recent times, was a geographic expression. And that's what India was, because, of course, the India that we know today didn't exist before the British turned up. That was a British creation. And when I was writing the book, I found it fascinating that what Gandhi wanted to do was actually preserve what the British had created. You know, you, you can argue the rights and wrongs of whether we should have been there or not, but what we've done is we created a unified state that functioned voluntarily amongst its, its you know, some of them were British provinces, some of them were princely states that paid lip service to British rule, but it functioned and it, and it worked, and Gandhi and Nero and the other nationalist leaders, they all understood that, but Churchill also understood that, of course, without British rule, sectarian hatred between the Hindus and the Muslims, who of course the minority population, would come to the surface, so all the time that Britain was there, it's a bit like Ireland, actually, I, I kind of realised that Ireland was the same that that historic hatred between the Protestants and the Catholics, it was kept in check by a common enemy, which, of course, was the British. And in a way, that was the same in India, that it kept a lid on the situation. You know, because Churchill gets the blame for Indian partition, but I don't see any other way that India could have gone. You know, the creation of Pakistan and what became Bangladesh. Uh, Britain gets the blame for that. But you go, well, actually, that was inevitable, that you would end up with Muslim homelands within India, because, of course, as, as I say, India did not exist until we arrived. We, we, you know, that, a continental Indian landmass is, is, a, is a British creation. Let me get back to the sort, of, the, the sort of pure military side for a moment. This museum was founded as a, a D-Day museum, National yep. D-Day museum, before it became the National World War II Museum. Churchill gets a lot of bad press, not necessarily here at the museum, I'll say that. <laughs> we love Sir Winston. Uh, but especially from you know, many U.S. military historians about his lack of enthusiasm for the big D-Day landings in France, his lack of enthusiasm for Overlord. So um, I'd like to ask you just two, two questions, and, and then we'll turn you over to the tender mercies of the audience for question and answer. What was he thinking at, at, at the time? What were his views of Overlord? That's first. And second... What alternative was there? I mean, we say it's a peripheral strategy. Would that really have brought down the Third Reich? And I wonder if you just address yourself to both those questions. Um, well, I think the, the problem that um, Roosevelt and Churchill had was, of course, that Stalin was constantly pressuring them to open a second front to take pressure off the Red Army. You know, it's no secret that the Red Army did the lion's share of the fighting against the Wehrmacht during the Second World War. The bulk of their divisions were there. And Church, uh, Churchill... Uh, Stalin was never grateful, really, for the resources that were sent because he didn't really want or need those. What he wanted was an opening of, you know, the Second Front in France because that would divert the, um, Hitler and the Germans. And that meant that Roosevelt and Churchill at some point had to give Stalin a commitment to open a Second Front, which they, they did. 
But it kept slipping. And Stalin was really annoyed and he got quite bitter and angry, particularly with Churchill, because the date kept constantly slipping. And the reason for that was, was that Roosevelt and Churchill had agreed that they would clear the Mediterranean first, so it was the Mediterranean first strategy. But also, of course, we all understand the concept of amphibious warfare from the Pacific and Normandy, but up until those points, things like landing craft uh, and combined operations didn't really exist. I'll just direct your attention to the landing yes, craft. Yes, the Higgins boat, indeed. I point out the yes, I mean, you know, we all take... Uh, amphibious assaults for granted because that thing enables you to deliver troops onto a beach and quickly into the face of the enemy. But those had to be designed and built. I mean, they didn't exist before. I mean, for instance, people say, well, why didn't Hitler invade England in 1940? One of the reasons was he didn't have any landing craft. In fact, what the Germans did was they rounded up every single coal barge they could find on the Rhineland, which are made of steel and are heavy, and cut the fronts off. And I think you can guess what would have happened if they tried to sell those across the English Channel. Uh, we, the British, would have not had to do much to them because the weather would have sunk them. So the concept, you know, because again, we look at things like uh, Sea Line and the invasion of Britain from the view of D-Day. We kind of think, why didn't Hitler do it? Well, it's simply because he did not have those resources. But it took time to build these things. And also, of course, there are only so many resources to go around. And the US military obviously had decided that they were going to clear the Pacific of all the islands of the Japanese garrisons, and that required landing craft. We also needed landing craft for the Mediterranean, and there were not enough uh, to do the second front when, you know, um, Stalin wanted it. You know, initially it was 42, well, that was completely impossible. Then it was 43, well, we were in the middle of the Med campaign by then. So we had to give Stalin a firm commitment that we definitely did it in 44. Um, which, of course, Churchill and Roosevelt did. But I think Churchill was always haunted by Gallipoli. I mean, that's the closer and closer D-Day got. He began to fret about it. You know, again, as I said earlier, he wasn't a callous man. He began to worry about British and American lives. What would happen when they hit the beaches? You know, the, the thing actually went, apart from Omaha, the thing went incredibly well. Um, but, of course, the generals and the admirals did not know that at the time. Um, and the thought of, you know, dead bodies washing up on the beaches in Normandy began to prey on his mind. So he began to get cold feet, and he started making suggestions that maybe they landed on the, you know, the Breton ports in Bordeaux, or they looked at cap capturing channel ports, because one of the reasons they did the uh, Dieppe raid, of course, in 1942, was to try and please Stalin, you know, um, because at least it was a gesture of diverting the Germans. It also tested German defences. And also, there's a very recent, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, a good book come out by uh, David O'Keefe, a Canadian historian, where he actually says that Dieppe, in, in part, was a spoiler operation to steal Enigma equipment to help the Allies spy on the Germans, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so he'd seen what happened, you know, with Dieppe, and it had... Dieppe soured relations, relations with Canada, quite honestly, because the bulk of the forces involved were Canadians, and they lost an awful lot of guys. The bulk of the assault force didn't actually get ashore. The whole thing was a shambles. So, of course, the nearer and nearer it got to 6th of June, the more uh, Churchill began to worry. I mean, I think, you know, there's that famous meeting, isn't there, with Ike and all the, all the generals, and he may have said it, he may not have, but, you know, ultimately it came down to Eisenhower making that decision, and I like to think it's true, you know, he, they met the sort of night before, and he said, okay, let's go, because, you know, he was Allied Supreme Commander, and he had to make that difficult decision. Did they postpone it? Because if they did, then the thing would slip for months, because the weather would get bad, and... Um, but, of course, in between which, Churchill had been worrying Eisenhower, Montgomery, um, you know, Cunningham, and all the, all the senior leaders keep saying to them, you know, oh... Is this, the, you know, are we going to the right place? Are these the right uh, beaches to land? But by the same token, he actually contributed a lot to D-Day because, of course, he famously came up with the idea of the Mulberry Harbors, you know, the artificial harbors they towed up. It was his idea for floating jetties. Uh, he was hugely supportive of 79th Armored Division, you know, and the specialized armored vehicles. The funnies, right? the yeah, funnies. the funnies that they produced. They built all these weird and wonderful engineering vehicles to help the British and uh, Canadian armies uh, get off the beach. You know, they had sort of bridging equipment and flail tanks. And, you know, one of the criticisms leveled at the American army was that they rejected use of them other than the, uh, the funnies. But, of course, particularly Omaha, it wasn't really suitable for them anyway because of the bluffs. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't have helped a great deal. Mm -hmm. um, so he did all those things. So he, his contribution was, 
was was positive. You know, it's like building the Mulberries. I mean, that that was a British engineering miracle that he got all the shipbuilding companies to build them somehow in secret. You know, these huge concrete blocks. But yes, he did get cold feet. Um, I, I thought your I, I thought your book really took really brought Winston to life there, and I thought it wasn't. The, we often read a caricature of it, but I think you're explaining it right now that. As the day got closer, just the feet got a little colder and colder and colder, and you can really follow that as you, as you go through here. I mean, one of the things, that, again, that really surprised me was because he couldn't affect uh, D-Day, uh, Roosevelt and Churchill had given Stalin an undertaking that there actually would be two landings in France. There was a second one, Operation Dragoon, that not many people know about, uh, on the French Riviera. Uh, and that was supposed to have been conducted at the same time as D-Day, but there weren't sufficient resources. So they did it in August, by which, by which time it's a complete waste of time because all the German units in the south of France had been drawn north to Normandy. And Churchill didn't want it to take place uh, because he'd set his heart on pushing up through Italy. So he didn't want any more Allied divisions diverted from Italy because obviously a lot had been sent to Normandy for the D-Day landings. So I was amazed to read that he'd gone to Eisenhower and he said, if these landings are not called off because he, didn't, he wanted his own way with Italy, I'm going to resign and I'll bring the British government down, um, which I was quite amazed by. Um, now Eisenhower, as we all know, the man was a saint, quite frankly, when it came to dealing with the senior commanders on a number Someone's of Someone's recording this in the audience? <laughs> wanna, wanna sure you know, get that. As we know, on a number of occasions, he had trouble... Uh, not just with American commanders, but with British ones, you know, the likes of Montgomery. They made his life very, very, very difficult. Uh, but he responded to Churchill. He said, well, look, you and Roosevelt gave this undertaking. It's too late, um, you know, to cancel the operation. All the ships are in place. All the men are ready and we're going to go. And I thought, on reflection, that actually was a key moment in Churchill's career because it signaled that his strategic direction and indeed dominance uh, of the conduct of the Second World War had come to an end because, of course, America by that point was the senior partner. Um, and indeed, from summer 44 round till, you know, 8th of May 1945, his ability to um, influence events in Europe had pretty much ended. Uh, by that point, he was kind of an overexcited bystander, if you like. The book is Churchill, Master and Commander, Winston Churchill at War. Uh, Anthony Tucker Jones, I recommend this book to everyone in the audience. And it's Q&A time now. Are you ready for that? Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. If you have a question in the audience, please, please raise your hand, and I'll bring the microphone to you. We'll start Prime with Minister, the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister. Wishes to be Greg recognized. <laughs> uh, Greg's going to give us a hard time. Yeah, we're in trouble. Um, in, yeah, in one of the wonderful nuances that you brought out in the book was Dunkirk was so famous, but the evacuation at Cherbourg shortly thereafter, I believe 143,000 yeah. troops, can you just talk to us about that? It wasn't, didn't get the fame that Dunkirk did, but it was equally no. important. Well, yes, I mean, as Rob and I touched on earlier, although the British army was um, evacuated from Dunkirk, there were still British forces there. And indeed, in a attempt to convince the French that Britain, you know, was not abandoning them, um, we still had a number of divisions in other parts of France. And indeed, a division was still shipped across the channel, even though we were evacuating the BEF, and a Canadian was, one was supposed to be sent over. But of course, the German advance through France was so swift that they had to be rescued as well. And people don't realize, actually, there were a series of other mini Dunkirks from other French ports. Um, and of course, Churchill got quite good at Dunkirk's because we had to conduct those in Greece after, you know, the Germans unceremoniously booted us out of Greece. And then out um, of Crete? Yeah, another, yeah, another Dunkirk with Crete. I mean, we got really good at it, you know. <laughs> uh, I have a quick question for you, and I hope I set this up properly. How was Churchill in using and dealing with his intelligence services as compared to, say, someone like, uh, like Hitler, who was famously not good, and even Stalin, who disregarded uh, intelligence that he received? Um, uh, yes, you're right. I mean, ironically, Stalin had very good intelligence, but he despised spies. I mean, he just thought they were traitors. So in the run-up to the German invasion of Russia, I mean, he had really good intelligence, and he simply chose to ignore it. 
Um, Churchill, of course, he did that classic thing he, as he made sure that they went to him direct. Um, again, you know, he, he insisted on having raw intelligence direct from Bletchley Park, which, you know, in modern times you would frown upon because it means it's not filtered through experts or analysts. It just went straight to him. Um, but it didn't seem to do him any harm. So, yes, he ensured that um, organizations like MI5 and MI6, which, in fact, he'd nurtured, you know, uh, in its early days, um, had direct access to him. And, in fact, he appointed a liaison officer who was sort of his point man with them, uh, which the intelligence services did not like a great deal. Um, in fact, they circumvented him, in fact, and didn't give the intelligence to the liaison officer. They just gave it direct, direct to Churchill. Same with the Battle of Britain. Uh, he kept his finger very firmly on the pulse by making sure um, he was informed all the time. Um, that was one of the interesting things, actually, I learned, I've digressed slightly, about Patton. Um, you know, that we always have this image of him being this sort of guts and glory and seat of his pants general, that he did everything by instinct. But actually, he had again, quite often courtesy of Bletchley Park and Enigma, really good um, intelligence. So quite often when it looked like, you know, he was doing something rather risky and dangerous, he was doing it because the Bletchley Park liaison officers that were assigned to him had given him really good intelligence. So actually, he's not as much as a gambler as everyone thought because actually he was being, you know, a clever general. May I take the a privilege from the uh, podium here to ask you a question, <laughs> Anthony? You know, as I read through the book, I couldn't help but think that this is a man whose life began in a different era than it ended in. Uh, so you, you have a, a man who participated in quite possibly the last great cavalry charge in history, the t famous 21st Lancers at Omdurman against the dervishes. And then you had a man who was commanding ar armies and, and, and great fleets in the biggest industrialized war of all time that culminated in nuclear weapons. So from, from cavalry with lances lowered, to nuclear weapons. That's Churchill's career as a commander. Is Churchill a modern man? Could you tell us something about that? Yes, I think so. He, he, he always understood, I think, the impact of um, technology on the battlefield and was very much a forward thinker. And a fine example of that is him taking the credit for inventing the tank, which popular mythology has that he did. Whereas, in fact, he didn't, but he happily took the credit because, of course, everyone's saying... You know, Winston came up with the tank, helped save lives during the First World War. But it was, in fact, a chap called Ernest Swinton who'd seen tractors on the Western Front, you know, towing artillery and things. And he thought, well, if we put armor plate on it and some guns, that would make a good weapon of war. But what Churchill did was, um, at the time when he was first Lord of the Admiralty during the First World War, the Royal Navy was in charge of British armored vehicles in France because the Royal Navy had armored cars. So Churchill... When Swinton's idea came across his desk, thought it was a really good idea, and promoted it, you know, said to the Royal Navy guys of the armor cars, we ought to look into this, which they did. And of course, in the meantime, the war office also had been prodded into action to look at it. Um, but actually, the real person who was the driving force behind the tank was David Lloyd George, who was the British Prime Minister, because he said to both those committees, you need to pull resources and wrap your heads around this fairly quickly uh, and so the tank was born but of course common legend is actually it was Churchill's idea but it wasn't but he never really made much effort to dispel that myth. Well, I want to thank you very much for having this conversation with us tonight Anthony Tucker Jones, Churchill, Master thank you. and Commander. Thanks. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please consider visiting nationalww2museum.org backslash podcasts for more episodes. Again, that is nationalww2museum.org backslash podcasts. Don't forget to rate and subscribe. We truly appreciate it. This series is brought to you by the Albert and Ethel Herstein Charitable Foundation which supports content like this from the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. I'm Jeremy Collins, signing off.